I'm this week. I'm just stepping in for uh, Rajiv and uh, Sushil as they had personal commitments. So I'm hoping that God will use me in the same way uh, that He does the two of them, and that you know He will He will use all our inefficiencies and make sure His word reaches just as powerfully, no matter who is leading the um, who is bringing the word. So um, with that, let me just quickly dive right in uh, so when we are opening uh, when this uh, when we are opening second samuel uh, chapter 7 uh, we know the little bit of the background that was there about uh, we we've, we heard about how the ark of the covenant was somewhere else and um, how david tries to move it first um, without seeking god's um, God's uh, idea, God's plan for how it needs to be moved, and he moves it, and we see the consequences of that. Finally, they get it right. They realize how what they need to do to make sure it is it is in a way that honors God. And we studied all about that last week, and um, uh, you know why God chose to reinforce certain messages with His people. Right? How what difficult it was with the death of one of the people who were transporting the ark. Um, so, but when we are coming into the seventh uh, chapter, we can just imagine David standing there uh, in his palace. He has entered this time of rest, um, and and there are no more enemies left to fight. He is living in this gorgeous place, and you can just imagine him going out into that balcony, that palatial house, looking out into the kingdom of Israel and seeing that tent in which that ark is residing. And he's feeling, um, he's still feeling uncomfortable, right? Uh, and, and, and it just indicates the fact that, you know, even, uh, even in that time of rest, even when he has achieved all the success um, that the world could give, uh, you know, his, his heart is still, how, how it just it shows you how his heart is still with, the God, uh, with God. And he's seeing that tent and it bugs him. And um, and he want, he's uncomfortable and he's not, uh, you know, generally when we are in our uh, successes, we sometimes uh, forget about God and we really are not, uh, you know, looking at um, how we got here. And we generally are just enjoying that moment. Most of the times it is during trials that we come to our knees, right? And we uh, look to God for answers. But here, even in that success, in that period of rest, David's heart is with God and he is seeing that tent and the ark there and he's uncomfortable, right? And he's sharing that with Nathan and Nathan, uh, you know, doesn't really consult with God when he, but he just says, absolutely, go ahead. Um, you know, whatever you desire, wherever, you, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do, because it sounds right. Uh, you know, David has conquered so many enemies and, uh, what would be the problem if he was building, um, uh, you know, a temple for the Lord? He, his, I mean, Nathan was like, absolutely go ahead without really seeking God's um, answer. He, he, he uh, decides to answer him, right? And we see that God's answer is kind of different. Um, so I just thought we would use that as the first question. So um, you all know the drill. Uh, use the chat box and the question is displayed here. What did David want to do for the Lord? What was the reason that God was giving David about not proceeding? So uh, before we just uh, get into that, I just thought that it was important. This, this chapter, right? One aspect of this chapter that I wanted to highlight is this chapter plays such a pivotal point uh, and it should be like if, if there was a center, if, if it could be put in the center of the Bible, that's where it should have been because it, it plays such a pivotal point. It brings together the Old Testament and the New Testament and we'll see what exactly it means and what why I'm saying that it should be in the middle. We'll see that a little bit more. But for right now, you just have to understand that this chapter is like so crucial in so many ways, not only because it talks about David's life and um, you know how God spoke promises over David's life but because of um, where this is pointing to or who it is pointing to um, and so uh, this chapter is so crucial so if we can 
um, just really spend time introspecting on the power, uh, the, the promises of God that are ever failing. That's what you see in this never failing. Um, you will see how that comes about in these chapter, in this chapter. So if you can just go ahead and answer uh, what you think uh, David wanted to do for the Lord and what was the reason that God was giving him about not proceeding. Can we just quickly use the chat box and answer? So and God has his reason for not, um, not giving, uh, you know, not wanting David to build um, that temple. And um, uh, yeah, like uh, Santosh said, he does have blood on his hand. He has fought many wars. Um, he has had to do Lord's bidding. It was all as per Lord's, um, you know, bidding. But yes, there is a reason why, um, you know, not David and not David, but somebody else uh, was chosen to build the uh, temple, right? So basically, uh, what uh, I, I think I wanted to just um, bring out was the fact that, you know, this, this particular chapter is tying the Old Testament with the New Testament. And it's just unfolding of this prophetic, um, uh, things that is happen going to happen, right? In in, in um, you know what the plans that God has for His people. So when you when we see the um, when we see God's no, right? How God is express. Uh, you know, David's intent is, you know, uh, desire is building a house to honor God. And we really can't see any other, um, you know, so what's wrong with that intent? Maybe, and that's why Nathan also says without even asking God, right? But when, uh, but when Nathan uh, does go back and, uh, and then God is speaking to him and he says, no, actually, I'm, uh, I don't want David to be the one to build the temple, right? Um, he is, so uh, the intent was, um, David's intent was to, you know, uh, make sure that the people of Israel were having a, were having a permanent place um, to gather and sacrifice. He's establishing this kingdom. It is not complete if the people don't have a place to come and worship and sacrifice because he was somebody who relied on God. And so, you know, he wanted a place for the people to come and rely on God um, for every little decision. Um, uh, David's concern, uh, you know, about he, he was he wanted to demonstrate God's glory in this beautiful building that he is going to be building for it. But the point was that his vision for God's glory was still so small. While his vision of the building itself might be big, but the vision, the the God's glory was not something that could be contained in David's mind, right? Uh, and so the the what what we see in this passage is the fact that you know what our our God doesn't require these buildings. That's not what He is calling us to do. Make buildings that will honor Him and you know uh, glorify His name, glorify our name, and then therefore force. Uh, God to bless us. See, I, I built a huge palace for you. I built a huge um, you know, a place where so many people can come. But that's not what God requires, right? He, he just, he's giving us the privilege of serving him and participating in his work. And he wants, he wants to um, bless us freely, right? It is not a conditional thing. And that's where we will see um, the covenant with uh, David White is so important. And I thought uh, uh, one verse that um, further highlights what God requires of us is just Matthew 25, 35 to 40. I, I have just copied that down there so that we can all just go through it. What does God expect us to do, right? He, he needs nothing. He, need, he doesn't need these buildings that we're constructing for him. He doesn't, he, but he wants the privilege. He is giving us the privilege to serve him. How can we serve him? And that's what Matthew 25, 35 to 40 talks about, right? For when I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Uh, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did, you, when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or need clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, uh, 
whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And I think, um, you know, that was when I was um, studying this passage. So, you know, one thing was, okay, if God requires nothing, really, he's, he's freely going to give us. So that means like, we are absorbed. We don't have any work to do. This is all great. I've got a free pass. Salvation is free, all of it. But he is calling us to serve him in a particular way. And I felt that it was important to, um, for us to hold each other responsible for some of these things that God is calling us to do. How can we demonstrate God's love to those around us? Uh, I think this is a concern that I've shared with many of us in the group also, right? What are we called to do to establish his kingdom on earth? And that is a very real responsibility that we have, right? And God is very clear as to what exactly he expects. He doesn't speak in riddles. He, he is clear as to what he expects from us in order that we serve him, right? So yeah, even the, so God is um, saying no, and um, we'll come back to like um, like uh, Santosh said, the fact that he had um, blood on his hand is something that I want to come back to. But right now in this particular time, this is all that is mentioned right in this uh, particular passage from um, uh, from Second Samuel seven one to seven. Yeah, and we, as we go on to the second part of of this um, of this reading of this uh, passage. Um, what I wanted us to focus on was the fact that how how God is, you know, uh, he, when God, uh, when uh, David has expressed his desire to build something, and he says, God saying, no, 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 let me tell you what I'm going to do for you, you know, uh, and, and then he's like, uh, he just blows David's mind away by David's desire how David's desire, God's, uh, God transforms it into his promise, right? Where he, he acknowledges David's death. It's a good thing. Uh, he, he, he realizes that there is no, um, no, uh, there is no, um, sorry, is my internet connection okay? Am I breaking up? I just got a message saying my internet no. connection is unstable. No, it's okay. It's okay. 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 So, yeah. So, um, so God is uh, you know, uh, redirecting. He says, no, no, no. You wanted to build a house for me. Let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. Right. Uh, I, I think um, the way in which uh, this this plays out, right, uh, and, you know, where David is like a child saying, I want to do something, I want to do something. And God is like that father who is like, relax, I know where you're coming from. This is what I have my plan for you. Right. So if we look at this passage, um, what are the main promises of God's covenant with David? Uh, is the second question that I thought we could answer. Uh, you can use a chat box or um, unmute yourself, whatever you're comfortable with. To what New Testament person does this ultimately refer, right? Um, can we just quickly enter your thoughts in the chat box? Right, okay. So if we don't have anything else, so I think, I, um, you know, when... God says yes, the, the you know, where he's coming from, what he's going to be doing for David's in David's life. I think, um, like I said, this chapter is pivotal in the fact that it is it is central to um, what happens in the Old Testament and what is happening in the New Testament, right? And if you look at Genesis 49, uh, 10, right? When uh, Jacob is about to die and he calls his... Um, uh, and he and he is calling his children around him, um, you know, just before he dies. Okay, so quickly, before I proceed, uh, Benita has said, um, your throne will be established forever. All right. Yes. Um, so, he, so there is, it is tying in. So the throne being established forever is a promise that was given in Genesis 49, 10 by Jacob to Judah. Right. When we're talking about he's prophesizing, prophesying about his children, what is going to happen in each of their lives. And there in 4910 is when we actually see the the this uh, this prophecy being spoken of. of right. Where um, where uh, uh, Jacob says, I mean, Israel says uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he who uh, comes 
until he to whom it belongs shall come and um, and the obedience of the nation shall be his, right? So he is, uh, you know, um, over there, the, it is very clear pointing, uh, you know, it is a very clear prophecy of the one to come. And that is when it was first um, spoken of, right? A throne being established um, that would be, that would last forever from the line of Judah, right? Um, so David was born of the line of Judah. There was, uh, you know, the aspects that he, uh, from this uh, portion that we, that we hear about, that we read, is the fact that there is a living house that he wants um, to um, build that will endure forever, right? So it isn't um, David's kingdom in terms of his son's um, having the kingship always, because we'll see later on how, you know, they have, they have um, disobeyed God and they get punished for that. The, it isn't um, uh, his kingship as in his sons who, um, who will have um, ruling authority over Israel, but he is talking about a living house that will endure forever. Right. And, and that is that, uh, you know, uh, encapsulates people and events from David's time, right up to Jesus and those after um, Jesus who believe in Jesus, right? So I think uh, that everlasting um, lineage that he talks about is that um, is that in um, that Jesus is going to come through uh, David's lineage. It, he is going to have it, um, David's name will be made great is one aspect of of this um, uh, of his promise God's promise to David right and if you see um, uh, you know the example of this right Jesus uh, was referred to uh, as as David's son right son of David you remember the blind man Bartimaeus. Um, was uh, wanting to be healed by Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's yelling out, son of David, have mercy on me. Everybody around him is shouting, shut up, don't disturb. Uh, you know, we're um, on our way. You cannot disturb. And then as soon as uh, Jesus stops, he says, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops um, because, you know, he's hearing that word son of David, right? To be, a, uh, to be known as son of David again was, in fact, uh, you know, the, the fact that, you know, Jesus was known as son of David shows the power of David's name also, right? Um, and, and he stops, Jesus stops, and he turns around and he says, bring him to me, and he heals. And those same people who are telling that blind man to shut up is now saying, come, 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 you know, come to Jesus, and he is there, and he's ready to save you and all that. But isn't that just brilliant how, you know, his name, uh, uh, Jesus is known by David's name. Uh, you know, in the end, his name is much more bigger than David. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, at that point of time to be understood as David's son, at that point of time to be referred to as David's son was indeed um, a, an acknowledgement to um, David's life, right? Um, the fact that, you know, he was building a safe place, a secure place for Israel, no more enemies would oppress it. Um, it was, in, in, you know, God was saying that this is a nation that I am going to build. It, it, you know, it, these prophecies, when, when a prophecy is shared, generally, if you're not looking at the time uh, scale, right, if you're not able to look at the entire time scale, we get, it, the, it messes up with our mind, right, because there was a period of time that there was no nation called Israel, and in 1947, I think, was the time that Israel actually came into existence as a nation, so, you know, when, when we talk about and the prophecies of God and uh, people who believe that Israel would be a nation because God uh, promised that it would be, uh, you know, at, at some point of time, you might question where exactly did that happen? You guys are Christians and you're believing it, but look at it. It's not yet happened, right? God prophecies are through time. He doesn't, it is not something that is failing. Israel um, was a place that, you know, um, for uh, after um, Solomon and his uh, few sons of his that went on to become kings, there was a period of time later on, and we'll come to it later also, um, that Israel was no longer uh, ruled by kings, right? And they weren't a nation. Um, so this, um, you know, the, the promise that God has, uh, gives him at this point of time is to be cherished here 
uh, you know, it's it's to be uh, not ignored, thinking that, okay, uh, at, because at one point of time, you could have dismissed it as saying, oh, it's not going to happen. It, it, you know, the Bible is full of contra uh, contradictions. And it's the thing, we can say all that, but actually how beautifully it is that it came into being, right? Um, and then the second aspect that God talks about in terms of um, the third um, aspect that God talks about is the fact that, um, you know, that uh, um, David's son and heir, okay, um, Solomon, who is yet unborn here, all right, uh, I, I, was the one who would be building um, this temple. I felt wow uh, you know when we, we've read the psalm so often um and we pray that over our children also um you know psalm 139 16 your eyes saw my unformed body all the days um, ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be right uh, can you imagine before solomon was born or thought of god had a plan for him uh, you know as a child uh, you know and he had that entire plan laid out for what Solomon was going to do. And I thought that Psalm 113, uh, 139, 16, just, you know, made so much of sense at that point of time at this, uh, at this place, right? When, when we're talking about, and, and he talks about one son, which is Solomon, uh, and then he's saying a greater son. There is, there is somebody else who is going to follow who is um, a four, uh, I mean, you know, a four, um, he, he's like Solomon in many ways, but he is so unlike Solomon in the fact that he's greater, right? He He's also in the business of building people up, right? And um, what are we, what is he building? He's building a kingdom that lasts forever through you and me, right? He establishes a kingdom, um, you know, in as we accept him as our savior, he comes to live in our bodies and he's establishing us as a temple of God, right? And uh, that is a kingdom that will endure uh, all weathers, all political, uh, you know, uh, uprisings. That is something, that is a kingdom that will really endure. Um, and so, you know, he talks about, he's again pointing to Jesus, right? Uh, and the eternal kingdom where, uh, you know, um, I think we spoke about this, the fact that Solomon's sons mess up after him, right? Uh, one or two people go on to become the kings, but they mess it up. And, you know, it, it is that um, sinful humans, uh, you know, um, who don't rely enough on God and who are not faithful in their walk with God because it is, uh, you know, it is a pattern with uh, with humans, um, but uh, you know during the time of Jeremiah, I think um, was when the nation of Judah was conquered by Babylonians, and um, and then so I, I felt um, you know the fact that you know we had to cling on to this promise at that point of time that uh, you know Luke one thirty one to thirty three where he talks about the fact that you will reign over. Jacob's descendants forever and of his kingdom there will be no end right it isn't about these earthly kings that we have but we have an eternal kingdom that is going to be established through the son of God uh, Jesus right and and he is the one who is calling us to form a kingdom and of that kingdom, there is going to be no end, right? So these are the aspects of, of that um, promise, the uh, Davidic uh, covenant um, that um, that is spoken of, that God speaks for um, over David, right? And uh, so the uh, I, I've the the way in which you know it's broken down into such a beautiful way. Um, it just uh, you know makes our uh, it, it just fills our heart with so much of um, you appreciate the fact that how God's um, so consistent across the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Um, passages that are related to the prophecy, right? Um, that we just read about and how there's a thread of continuity throughout, whether it is in the Old Testament in Genesis to this uh, time and even in the New Testament where we're talking about Luke um, 131 through 66 
um, books, yeah, 40 authors and 2,500 years, God's word is consistent. And there is this thread that is binding uh, that it never changes and it is, it is consistent. And that just shows us the author behind the actual author, right? The accuracy of God's come, uh, word is something we should be clinging on to um, when we see this uh, Davidic covenant. Um, like um, like um, Santosh said, Jesus, uh, I mean, uh, David was, um, had his own reason. It, it comes to us later, uh, um, much later it is revealed to us what exactly was the reason for David's disqualification for building the temple. I think it was shared in... Um, in First Chronicles twenty eight uh, three, um, it it is mentioned that David had blood on his hands, and that's why um, God said that you know you you are a man of war, and you have blood on your hands, so you cannot be the the king, or you know you cannot be the one to establish the temple of God. He wanted he wanted somebody, it's a man of war. David was a man of war. His son Solomon was the king of peace right and during solomon's reign there was an extended time of peace and so um, you know what it's saying is that you know solomon is is representing the king of peace you know he's he's depicting the king, king of peace and jesus is known as the prince of peace right and he is also building a house for us which is established um, you know uh, which only a peacekeeper can do so that's what God is saying. That's the disqualification for Jesus, uh, for David, um, not to be the one um, to build the temple, right? Um, because he had blood on his hands, he couldn't do it. But the but the king of peace, Solomon, could do it. And then we have the prince of peace who is establishing the kingdom that lasts forever. And that is talking about Jesus. And um, so those are the, uh, you know, those are the things in which you can see how the Old Testament and the New Testament just come together in such consistency that we can say, okay, yes, uh, you know, we don't believe in, in, a, in a God that changes his mind now and then. He is consistent. His word is true. Um, we can always depend on him, right? So with that, I thought we would come to the third part where God, uh, David is now, you know, um, uh, God has shown David this amazing future. And uh, I just wanted us to look at David's prayer and just appreciate what exactly is David saying in his prayer and just see his reaction. And if you can just go ahead and answer how is God's covenant and God's love linked together? When we see this portion of 2 uh, Samuel 7, 18 to 29, how is God's covenant uh, and his love linked together? How, does it, uh, how is it all coming together? If you can just um, use the chat box um, or go ahead and unmute yourself. So I thought, you know, um, I, we would, I would just look at this covenant love in, in these two aspects, right? So God has this uh, purpose um, for David, which is beyond anything that, um, you know, he could have ever imagined. He was the eighth son of a farmer, of a, of a, of a farmer who was overlooked by his family. And here he was ruling the kingdom of Israel, right? And, and he, and he, the way, I mean, you would think that David would be disappointed, right? But he's, he's coming and um, he, the way his prayer is so beautiful and that it's just so humble and that he's so grateful. And he is always remembering who he was before God came into his life and took control of it, right? Um, so, uh, you know, the God is ordaining everything for his glory and for his people's greater good. Like you said, Santosh, he knows that from the beginning to the end, the, the plan is, um, how do I get all my people back to me, right? And he wants us to, and, and his, by his grace, um, you know, by his plan that was shared in the Davidic uh, covenant, he shows how, what his plan is. Through the lineage of uh, of David, he is uh, ensuring that a Messiah comes, and it's called a messianic prophecy because it's pointing to the Messiah. 
and you know he he is making sure that that, that lineage of david through the lineage of david the whole world would be saved right and uh, you know david also uh, talks about this uh, the fact that you know like israelites you chose israelites you saved the israelites from their slavery egyptian slavery and you've extended it to a thousand generations for no good in ourselves in themselves right and so that's the same uh, thing that is applicable to us now as uh, children of um, of believers in jesus christ right we have no it was not because of our capabilities that god has uh, extended his uh, you know uh, adoption he has extended his adoption for us um, but it is just because uh, he chose to extend it, he chose to demonstrate his love right um, it wasn't because we showed any capabilities because we always failing and we've seen that so um I, as we were going through this the 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 linkage to psalm 89 right uh, was very clear in the fact that it's it, it is at that same time it is written around the same time of it, it talks of the covenant uh, love that god is demonstrating in david's life and so i just thought we uh, you know some themes that we would pick out from um, god's covenant love that was displayed in david's life even in in the first verse the first verse talks about the fact that you know his faithfulness will last through all generations and we are we are seeing that you know um, at the end it is like he's asking about the faithfulness that was displayed in david's life so the first part uh, of psalm 89 talks uh, and talks about you know exalts god and it's about um, how you are the ruler of all creation and um, you know you you uh, you even though you punish david's disobedient sons but still your promise is true because you've established a throne that will last forever it talks about that from that exalting lord and exalt praising god for all his mercies the second half suddenly goes into a depth of despair where we are seeing that uh, you know circumstances um, here because uh, the psalm the psalmist is is um, you know saying that circumstances around us will shock us i think that is so true especially now with all the things that we are seeing going on especially in afghanistan the images the the stories that we are reading about uh, children being passed over the fence and things like that it is uh, it is sad um, times and when you look at and you when we focus on all those aspects when we focus on the damage that covid is doing just when you think that covid is under control it's again out of control just when you think uh, lockdown to i mean you know the wave is over there's another wave that comes it's never ending uh, so you know I, i can see where the psalmist is also getting that sense of dismay because of seeing all the things that is going on around right and he's and in verse 46 he says how long lord i mean we've been in lockdown for three uh, two years now a little bit more than two years and we are saying how long lord uh, you know we we've, we've been in this kind of a interaction for a while and we are saying uh, so we can see where uh, the psalmist is coming from but then uh, something that i think um, that is also there for us to learn uh, from the psalmist is the fact that even in the depths of dismay even in the depths of dismay god is asking us you know the psalmist is saying i'm going to look to my god uh, lift my eyes to his faithfulness right so even though when david has been told at this point of time he is not going to be the one building the temple right and and he has how does he instead of moping and instead of saying oh gosh i really wanted to do this for lord this was in my heart and you know there is a, uh, it was not the will of god some sometimes even when it is in our heart and it doesn't it doesn't mean it is in the will of god right and that is something i think we need to be able to differentiate and ask god for discernment of of the fact that if it's in my heart lord does it mean that it's always your will in my life um so he wasn't moping around he spent the rest of his life making sure said okay you my son is going to be building the temple i'm going to make sure that 
you know, he has everything he needs. So when the time comes, he's going to build a temple that will glorify your name, right? And so he made sure he was doing everything possible the rest of his life to uh, accumulate things for the um, for Solomon, who was the king of peace, who was called to build um, something for, uh, build the temple of God. So, um, so you know, it, it was about doing something and... I felt that that was an important lesson from this was uh, how, how would I uh, look at doing something for God, even though I am not see, I may not be able to see it to fruition, right? Where is my mind at when God says that, okay, it's in your heart, but that's not my will for you. How do I react? Um, and, and do I, you know, do I continue to do the will of, uh, you know, do I continue to, um, you know, contribute to it, even though it, I can see that it may not happen in my lifetime. I felt that was something that uh, we should, um, you know, with that, we could get into the breakout room. David's uh, desire um, was always um, to make God's name great, right? So I just had these few questions, which I wanted us to just sign up, uh, you know, at the end, just ponder about um, if David's desire was always to make sure God's name was great. Where is our desire? Is this our desire in the in the way in which we work? Are we, um, you know, are we ensuring that God's name is glorified? Um, you know, and the, and the responsibilities that we are called to, are we ensuring that God's name is glorified and his name is great forever, right? Um, when our ch when challenges come, uh, you know, does our faith waver? Um, or are we looking at um, God's word for strength and for endurance was something that I think uh, that came to me, in, you know, through this passage about how God, even through his no, God, I, um, David was so beautifully praising God. You know, I, even through that no, he's not disappointed. He just keeps on praising God. Thank you, Jesus, for the plan that you have for my life, right? And thank you, God, for the plan that you have for my life. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, this entire portion talks about Jesus, as uh, it points to Jesus is coming again to establish his kingdom. And how are we going to be living for him today? Um, and I thought, you know, as I leave you with the question, I thought the passage, um, how are we living for him today? I thought for that passage, we would just quickly go through First Peter 3, 9 to 17. I'll read it out. If you can take it out in the meantime and just follow through, it would be great. 1 Peter 3, uh, 9 to 17. So there are three or four or uh, five things that God is, you know, asking us to, uh, you know, in the way in which we are living for him. He's asking us to do a few things. So uh, uh, Peter 3, 9, contrary blessing, knowing that you have been called to this, that you may inherit a blessing right? So he is asking us to retaliate with a blessing. God is calling us to say that whatever anybody does to you, however we are, uh, you know, uh, treated, we are called to retaliate with a blessing, right? The second aspect that how God wants us to live for him, right? First Peter 3 was uh, 10 and 11. I'm just going to read that out. Let him refrain his tongue from evil for his lips uh, uh, and his lips from speaking deceit turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it, right? So we are asked to control our tongue. Um, you know, it's so easy when people harm us to retaliate in that moment without thinking about how we are representing God. But God is very clear in what he's expecting us to do, not and, and to control our anger and to control our tongue specifically. So, uh, the first Peter 3 verses 13 and 14. Um, so 13 says, who is he who will harm us if we are followers of what is good, right? And 15 says, be ready uh, to give a great defense, okay? Um, yeah, so in 13 and 14 is, who will harm us if we are followers of what is good? Living in courage, knowing that, okay, we have the Lord of Lords as our savior, 
we don't need to be afraid, right? Um, the, the other expectation that he has, how are we supposed to be living for him is um, First Peter 3, 15 to 16, which is be ready to give a defense any time anybody asks you for the reason of what is the hope in you. We are asked to speak about God. And I mean, you know, and just what we did here right now when we talked about his faithfulness in our lives, I thought it was just one way that we were, uh, you know, living for him today, right? Demonstrating his faith in his work in our God, in our lives. And the 15th, the 17th verse is that it, because it is the will of God to suffer for what doing good rather than doing evil, trusting him no matter what, can we just trust him that he will work all things for our good. 